In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ has given to die for all of us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. It's at this time that we sing the Kyrie.
us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. Kyrie eleison every day. For your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water that you nourish our souls with your body and blood. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Give me a lesson on our world and on our way. Give me a lesson every day. It's at this time that we sing our canticle of praise. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain. God set us free to be people of God. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun His reign. first lesson for this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah, the 61st chapter, beginning with the 7th verse. Because the shame of God's people was double, and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion, everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery and wrongdoing, I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Here ends the first reading for this morning. The second reading for this morning is taken from the book of Galatians, the fourth chapter, beginning with the fourth verse. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Here ends the second reading for this morning. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for my life, for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves saying, 
How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the gospel of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord God. Amen. So there's one last book that I want us to specifically take a little bit of time to look at, and that is Paul's letter to the Romans. Now remember, timeline, a number of weeks back, this letter uh, is put out shortly before um, the great fire and persecution of Christians in Rome. Uh, that also coincides with probably when Paul was executed by the state government um, of Rome. The empire kills Paul because of his message of a risen Jesus, as well as his common his is really his his uh, commentary on some of the Roman practices of the time. Um, but let's let's just explore uh, the letter of Romans a little bit more. The reason I do this is it is the longest of the epistles, uh, especially the Pauline epistles. It's probably one of the last that uh, we can be certain Paul wrote and sent. It's also for us as Lutherans, one that uh, we hold very near. Actually, a lot of Protestants um, hold Romans in a special place. Romans for mainline Protestants, as well as I could, I would dare to venture and say the church at large. Um, Romans plays a key role in developing theology and belief systems and understandings about certain things that are going on. We've talked about some of the struggles with that, right? Over the past few weeks, we've talked about context, context, world behind the text, what's happening in the time that Paul or the writers of any of the books are writing, what is a spe what's the specific things that the writer and that the Holy Spirit are addressing? And we lose some of those important contexts because of translation. Because we also don't remember some of this history. We don't think about What's happening? So I'm going to try to post a picture on this side of a picture of uh, what's often referred to as an interlinary Greek to English Bible. I've mentioned it multiple times in this sermon series and other sermons that I've recorded and preached in person. That Greek, the ancient Greek, is a different, it's a different language, but is, is a beast unto itself. Um, some of the things that I want to remind you of is there's no punctuation. So we know in the English language, a comma, or placing the end of a sentence at one point, can drastically 
drastically impact the meaning of the sentence, the meaning of the passage, could even have enough of an effect that could play a role in the overall story. So interpreters, translators are continually assessing this, looking at it, looking at what has been done in the past, looking at different translations, looking at the original language, looking at the history, all while trying to translate. So anytime there's a new translation that comes out, it's important to remember this is why they're doing it. It's also important, and again, maybe down here, I'll show a quick picture of there's a spectrum when it comes to language and biblical translations. Interlinearity is as close to word for word as you can get, but as you saw in the picture, it gets a little confusing. And then you get um, what you have as far as paraphrases. So like the Message Bible, uh, it tries to get at the heart of what's trying to be conveyed while using modern language. But anytime, anytime we go from Greek to English, there's interpretation happening. Anytime we try to modernize the language beyond the ancient Greek, there is interpretation happening. And interpreters may make decisions based on their context as well. So word usage that would have been used in the 1700s maybe and often is different than word usage that we use today. So translators today are wrestling with how do I stay true to what the Greek is trying to convey and say while also trying to put, put language in a way that our modern ears and minds can understand it. Um, that comes into play a lot, and oftentimes one of the most controversial passages, um, a number of the most controversial passages, can be boiled down to an issue of translation. So we, we wrestle with this. I wrestled with it about that much. I've taken four classes on biblical Greek. I have tried my hand at translating and reading ancient Greek, Kone Greek, biblical Greek into English. And it is hard because many of the words in Greek that we have or that they had, we don't really have equivalents to now. Um, I've also, my Greek professor made me, made us, the class, translate from modern English back to ancient Greek. And that was even more difficult because many of the words and nuances we have now. So that's enough about the language. On to Romans. I say that because Romans has one of those passages. Romans also has its um, issue of There's tension. <clears throat> There's tension between Christians and the Roman Empire. Remember, Rome, Rome doesn't like the Christians. There's issues between Christians and the Jewish faith. Um, there's, there's tension amongst these groups. So we have to also take a step back and say, who did Paul intend for this letter to be received by? And it was the early Gentile followers of Jesus. It was Gentiles that did not follow the law. Um, although, although Paul does make a case that they should practice the law, namely circumcision, get in Romans a lot of talk about circumcision, uh, Paul encourages them 
that they should observe the law with the with circumcision, um, even though they're not becoming Jewish. So carrying that thread from the Old Testament to the New. Paul also explains that they should turn away from idols and worshiping um, idols and the Roman gods and anything else that's put above God, Jehovah, the God of Abraham. Um, And by doing that, the Gentiles would then serve as witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, to the power of Jesus. So Paul, in many ways, is trying to set this community up um, and address some of the civic and um, daily life issues, as well as telling the new Christians, even though that term is not used by them, uh, they would just be followers of Jesus. Um, So Paul's dealing with that and saying, by following the law, by adhering to the law, you can in turn be part of witnessing to God's original chosen people. Paul does say in Romans that God has not gone back on God's promise to Abraham and Sarah. Although we often will skip over that part, um, especially if we are looking at the scriptures and the New Testament in a super sessionalist way, we will see that, we will say that, um, and we can read Paul as saying it is super sessionalist, even if we don't look at that verse, that chapter where Paul does not say that. We also have to keep in mind that Paul Paul does not turn his back on the law completely. Remember who Paul was. Paul does talk about freedom. But I think, and this is what Luther, I think, is trying to get at, is there is some expectation of living a life in response to the gift of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, Luther does plant a lot of his theology in Romans, because Romans, like I said, can be also read as um, being anti-works righteousness, which Luther points to, remember that, even with some of these daily uh, lives and uh, Paul saying you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z, Paul says a number of things we shouldn't be doing, Paul still does have this theme that we are freed from the law through Jesus, through Christ. Uh, So we're not living in a works righteous theology. This is how Luther approaches it. which in turn, again, the problem with that can ultimately be that Martin Luther does do this, and we have to be careful not to, pointing towards the entire Jewish faith as works righteousness, um, which many, including myself, would say that's not really what's going on there, but I'm, I'm a pastor, not a rabbi. So we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep in mind the situation, it's a small group that Paul is writing to. And again, it's a little bit easier. Some of these laws, some of these advice, some of these things can apply to a small group. It can be a little bit difficult, more difficult when we expand it out. So we have to keep all this stuff in mind. This is why we're spending the time doing this. Let us remember that Paul, yes, bears great witness, brings truth, is used by the Holy Spirit to remind us of the work that God is doing. And God is still revealing God's self today. God has not stopped once the Bible was put together. 
God continues. And thank God for that. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. God of wisdom, enlighten your church. Guide theologians, biblical scholars, authors, and seminary professors as they seek greater knowledge and invite others into deeper understanding. Teach us to ask faithful questions and open our minds to new ideas. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, mend the earth. Cool warming oceans and preserve melting ice caps. Increase our awareness of changing climate patterns and reveal new approaches to the ecological challenges we face. Shield those in the path of hurricanes or tropical storms. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, direct our leaders. Grant them courage to lay aside political grudges, and renew their determination to address difficult conflicts. Guide them in the work of reconciliation. God, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. God of compassion, tend to the wounded. Rescue those tormented by mental illness or mired in addiction. Ease the anxiety of those dealing with dementia. Come quickly to help all who are grieving and all those who suffer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of beauty, inspire hearts. Bless those whose vision and musical gifts enliven our world. Bless the creative work of poets, hymn writers, composers, painters, sculptures, and all others that enrich our daily life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of resurrection, <clears throat> bring us to new life. Give us the living bread from heaven through which we abide in your love. And on the last day, raise us with all the saints to eternal life. In your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> we lift these and all our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's at this time that we ask that you continue to support the digital ministries of South Mountain Shared Ministry. If this worship service, service or services in the past have meant something to you, we ask that you financially continue to support this vital ministry, as well as the other ministries of both St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Burkittsville and Bethany Lutheran Church in Brunswick. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we may be for the, sign, the world signs of your gracious presence in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. The God of all grace, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.